Court is in session. You may be seated. <clears throat> Mr. Housel, can you see and hear me? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Ms. Bennett, can you see and hear me? Can, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Ms. Simmon, can you see and hear me? Yes, Your Honor. The matter before the court is the case of the people of the state of Michigan versus Nathan Helsel, file number 2012874 and 12826F8. This is the time and date set for a sentencing. Mr. Helsel, Ms. Bennett, on behalf of the Attorney General, and Ms. Simmon, on behalf of the Department of Corrections, appear by video. Mr. Cherry and the court, court reporter and county clerk, appear in the circuit courtroom for Wexford County. I understand, Ms. Bennett, that there are a number of victims who may be wanting to join our meeting to appear. That is true. I'm asking, it would be my approach to allow them to all join the meeting at this time so that they can observe. However, I will ask that the county clerk keep them muted until such time as they may be asked to give a statement to the court. Is there any objection to that? No objection. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Cherry, any objection to that procedure? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. We'll take a moment to allow them to join. I'm sorry. They have joined us there. Okay. They have all joined the meeting and they're now muted. Mr. Cherry, have you and your client had a chance to review the sentence information reports and the pre-sentence investigation report along with the updated pre-sentence report with respect to jail credit? And if you have, do you have any corrections or additions you'd like the court to address? I do, Your Honor. I have and I do have corrections. You have and you do. All right. Yes. You may do so. Yes. Your Honor, beginning with the sentencing information report in 20-12784FC, the offense date is listed as September 1st, 2018. I believe at the plea hearing there was a lot of discussion about what date we were going to use for the plea incident and we agreed on the July 30th, 2019 date. So I believe that that would be the appropriate date to enter there for the offense date as it's scored as of here. You're looking at the sentence information report for that? That's correct. I thought we agreed on July 3rd, Your Honor. That's what I had, Your Honor. You had that we agreed to a July 1st date for my notes. 3rd, I apologize. 3rd. My notes reflect as to that file and I'm simply looking at my notes at the plea that it was the July 30th date of 2019. I don't know if I'm correct or not, but that's what my notes reflect. I had 3rd, but I don't think for the purposes of the plea it's going to make a difference. So you have no objection to us adjusting that date? No, I have no objection. Mr. Cherry, does it have an impact on the scoring of the guidelines? I don't believe it has an impact on the scoring of the guidelines, Your Honor. I'm willing to go then with the July 30th date. Ms. Simmons, can you make the appropriate change? I can, Your Honor. Can you repeat the docket number that that applies to? That applies to the docket number ending in 8-4, am I correct, Mr. Cherry? That's correct, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, on that same page, we would be objecting to the scoring of 25 points to OB-12 being contemporaneous offenses committed within 24 hours. Rather, I think the offenses that Ms. Simmons was looking at was the offenses over the scope of several years, so that would not be appropriate. Does it make a difference what the date of the offense is, whether there's an offense within 24 hours then? Judge, the reason 25 points is scored from my vantage point is there were multiple penetrations on one day, and because he only pled to one penetration, the points in OB-11 that normally give us 50 points now get scored in 12 or 13. Therefore, the multiple penetrations would be scored in 
12. And that's why I scored 25 points as well uh, as they are in the report. Mr. Cherry? Um, what, 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 are the, what are the criminal acts that occurred within 24 hours of July 30th? Your Honor, there are multiple acts within 24 hour periods of fellatio, uh, cunnilingus, genital, vaginal penetration. Um, because those points are now no longer being scored in OB11, they are other acts that are not going to be other convictions, and that therefore it is appropriate to score that 25 points in OB12. Uh, had he is, been convicted of multiple penetrations, is, he would have had there facts? Are, are, time out, time out, time yes. out. Are there, are there facts? That support that there were that there were those acts of criminal sexual conduct within 24 hours of the July 30th date, and is that contained in the agent's description of the offense? It is also it is contained in the agent's description, which was based show, on. Show me, show me, show me where, show me where it's contained. It is also in the testimony, Your Honor, at the preliminary exam as well. Well, I, has that been made part of this record? Uh, I don't know if it has. I would ask that it be part of the record, Your Honor, as or part of the transcript. Okay. Can you can you point out to me then where that is in the transcript of the preliminary exam as it relates? I can. That's why I asked the question. I asked the question if the date of the offense is going to impact the guidelines, and then the first challenge to the guidelines affects the date. So I, I, I don't want us to go in a circle here. Go ahead. Show me the show me the location, Ms. Bennett. I have pull, I, I pulled out the transcript. I'm pulling it open right now, Your Honor. All right. Ms. Simmons, do you have any documentation that would support your scoring of 12? I see in your in your summary on page three on CFJ 284 that you don't you don't detail what those incidents are, and you don't mention. Well, you said behavior within one day. Do you have that any documentation that supports that? I was just reading through the the narrative as well, Your Honor, and I. I cannot point out specifically. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that your narrative defined any dates, frankly. Right. Your agent's description didn't define any dates. I don't think we can discern that unless there's a specific date and we agree that that was on or about the 30th. Well, I think the only thing that we have, Your Honor, is actually Mr. Helsel's testimony at the plea hearing where he testified that they had sexual intercourse on that date. Yes, I, I recall that. And, and, the, and I'm going and I apologize for taking this time to do this, Your Honor. I'm just trying to get through because the, the exam testimony, I'm trying to remember exactly where it was. Um, the testimony is pretty extensive because while we're stipulating to a date, um, the testimony at exam and the investigation shows that this actually went on for a span of many, many months. So I'm trying to and narrow I, it down. I, I, I understand all of that, but that's precisely why I wanted to narrow down an event as it relates to each crime, because I know that it impacts the scoring of both 11 and 12. 
and you have to be precise about that. I have to have a preponderance of the evidence that supports the score, or I have to change it. I understand, Your Honor, and, and I'm going through the testimony right now, for instance, and again, right. this is on like months. Unfortunately, I'm not getting a 24 hour yet, but page 44 okay. of the transcript, um, okay. where the victim had indicated, and this is to an act of intercourse, um, answer, um, how many times do you think this happened at the bottom of the page line 23, probably about 20 times in that month. So I'm going through it because that's kind of what the testimony was. So I'm just trying to find where we got a specific to one day. May I also make a suggestion, Your Honor, that perhaps we might get this as well from the victim impact statement today? Well, do you have a, a reference to something that would allow us to, to uh, um, identify July 30th? Are you, is your victim going to be able to identify that? I don't know that she's going to be able to identify that specific date from well, the I'll, little I'll less than a year. I'll, I'll allow you to call witnesses as part of this hearing if you choose to, but I think she'd have to be sworn. Then I would allow her to make an impact statement that would be separate from that if she chose to. Is that okay. what you're after? I, I, I think that's appropriate, Your Honor, because I, there, the testimony in the exam transcript is really extensive. And I, I know we covered it, but I can't. I don't want to take up any more of the court's time trying to go through every page of the transcript. I apologize. Well, but my concern is, is that we're going to get a general description of things that happened as opposed to a specific event that led to this conviction in this particular file. I understand. Uh, do, do you need a break out with her for a moment to determine that? If the court wouldn't mind. Mr. Chair, any objection to that? No, Your Honor. Thank All right, you. we'll allow the clerk to have you break out with, I'm sorry, identify the victim again that you want to have you break out with. Samantha Helsel. Samantha, thank you. Yes. Madam Clerk, are you able to identify her as a individual? I can. I'm sorry? I can, yes. You can identify her? Okay, I just want to make sure we can identify her as the, as one of the uh, persons that have joined the Zoom meeting. All right, we'll allow that to happen. We'll take a brief recess then. Thank you, Your Honor.
Ms. Bennett, have you had enough time in your breakout room? I have, Your Honor. I don't know if I told her to. Oh, there we go. Yep, I have, Your Honor. All right. Do you intend to call a witness now? I do. I have a different date of July, unfortunately, but I just would like to take a little bit of testimony, if that's okay. Well, I don't want there to be any confusion here. If we were specific at the time of the plea, we are stuck with that date, Ms. Bennett. And we had a dispute about that when we started this, and I've simply relied upon Mr. Cherry's representation and, frankly, a note that I put on my documentation that are not part of the court record, just simply my own personal notes that reflected the July 30th date. Do we need to clarify that more? In just speaking in the breakout room with her, I mean, obviously she's a teenager, and dates are not going to be a strong suit for something like this, but she does have a date of July 11th. I don't think how is July 11th relevant. In terms of the... In terms of OV 11 and 12. Yes, yes. And the reason I can, as an officer of the court, the reason I can tell the court that that date sticks out is there was a family trip. There was what? Part of that. I'm sorry? I'm sorry, there was a... I just didn't hear. Just because of the technology, I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry. I had the date as a July 11th, and the only reason that date is something that can be remembered is it was the subject of a family trip. All right. Well, let me stop just for a moment. I don't mean to get us off point, but do we have a dispute with respect to the date and the file ending in 2-6? No. Do we have a similar objection as to 2-6? No. All right. I wanted to be clear. Yes. But Ms. Bennett, I don't mean to be problematic, but how is that relevant to my scoring on a July 30th date of something that happened on a date that she remembers when they took a trip? How is that relevant to scoring those two variables? You're absolutely right, Your Honor. It's not as to that date, and that's why I just wanted to be forthright with the court and let the court know that's the information I could provide. I'm not opposed to her making any statement she wants to as a victim, but in terms of my evidentiary hearing to establish the standards for scoring of the guidelines, it would seem to me that that testimony would be irrelevant. Am I mistaken? As to July 30th, no, you are not mistaken. And, Your Honor, ultimately these points are not going to change the sentence agreement. Yeah, that was my next point. As a practical matter, perhaps they don't change the agreement that's been reached, although I suppose that I should at least – I want to try to accurately score them, of course. That's fair, Your Honor. All right. Your Honor, I would agree that they don't change the agreement. They do change the guidelines, though. Yeah, I understand. So, Ms. Bennett, did you wish to offer any other evidence in response to Mr. Cherry's challenge to the scoring of offense variable 12 in the file ending in 8-4? No, that would have been it, Your Honor. All right. I'm going to then adjust the scoring from the file ending in 8-4 with respect to offense variable 12 and 25 points to zero points. Mr. Cherry, do you have other challenges to the sentence information reports? No, Your Honor. I believe that would give us a total OV of 55, which would change the guideline range to 51 to 85 months, which is within the agreement. Fifty-five is the total. Is that a level – is that a level five? It goes down one level, yes. Ms. Bennett, any objection that it now changes to 51 to 85? Am I correct, Mr. Cherry? That's correct, Your Honor. No objection, Your Honor. I'll give you a chance to look if you want to, look at your guidelines. All right. Did you have challenges to the other sentence information report? I do, Your Honor. On page one of CFJ 284 under evaluation and plan. All right. The last paragraph of that section, along with the continuation of that paragraph and the following paragraph on the next page, first, if they were appropriate, would belong under the agent's description of the offense, and second, they contain some pretty intense language about instances which have not been proven, pled to, or dealt with, so I don't know how they're appropriately part of the evaluation and plan for Mr. Helsel under the Michigan Department of Corrections. To be clear, you're starting with the last paragraph that starts on page one of 284? Correct. It begins, it is hard to even. Yeah. All right. Ms. Bennett, your response to Mr. Cherry's objection to that paragraph that starts on the bottom of page one and continues to the top of page two? Let me just, bottom of page one, Your Honor? Yes, CFJ 284, which is in the evaluation and plan, the 
paragraph that starts it is hard to even know where to begin in this traumatic cases and then it continues on the top of page two the reason i would say that is relevant your honor is um part of this case and and the record that has been made in this case part of our sentence agreement are these other acts and the rights of these other acts witnesses to send statements and participate in today's sentencing hearing and part of that is the case that was in deliberately written into our sentence agreement for very specific reasons it doesn't affect the guidelines it doesn't affect the sentence agreement um, but they are part of the sentencing hearing today so i think it's completely appropriate that they would um, that the author of the report get to issue that information along with her opinions on that matter it is her report so i think it's appropriate given specifically what we agreed to in this case um that may be true it, that wouldn't apply however to the uh, item that's referred to in the second full sentence and continuing almost to the bottom of that first page with respect to a juvenile prosecution that wasn't part of your agreement that was already resolved so and it's been expunged your honor it's not supposed to be in public record at all well it's available to law enforcement i understand I, that I, I find that to be relevant with respect to sentencing that language i also find based on Ms. Bennett's argument. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Chair, you want to respond to her argument. I didn't give you that chance. It, Your Honor, the only thing that I would say is that our agreement was that the victims be allowed to make a statement. Um, and Was there not an agreement that there be no further prosecution? There was, I'm sorry, there was agreement that there be no further <coughs> prosecution um, and that they be allowed to make a statement for the purposes of closure for themselves, but not that their statements would be included in the sentence information report. Well. The, the sentence information report uh, is, is the uh, scoring of the guidelines. The pre-sentence report I'm sorry. Uh, is, of course, the agent's impression and the evaluation and plan involves the circumstances that surround the defendant. Uh, I'm satisfied, although it contains some strong language um, and, frankly, strong opinion by the agent, uh, which is not necessarily helpful to the court. Uh, it does, in fact, relate to items that were agreed to as part of the uh, sentence agreement, pardon me, the, the plea agreement here that there's no further prosecution and therefore it's relevant for that purpose. The prior record with respect to his juvenile behavior, uh, although it is not public record, it's available to law enforcement and clearly appropriate for a circuit court and evaluate an adult offender. So I'm going to deny the request to strike of that paragraph. Did you have further corrections, Mr. Chair? On page three of that same report, um, an update of the guideline scoring, uh, taking out the sentence yeah. that relates to OB12. Right. I agree that that needs to be changed. There's no objection to that, Ms. Ms. Bennett. The later no, report thank you. And, Your Honor, my, my last objection, it comes under the agent's description of the offense. And I think here we have the same problem that we ran into with OB11 and 12, which is the agent describes several years or, or a multitude of offenses rather than the description of the sentencing offense. Um, we don't have a description of the sentencing offense. We just have a narrative of the entire relationship between the victim and the defendant. And that probably applies to both fi both uh, separate files. You Actually, make it, the same argument? It doesn't, Your Honor. Actually, oh, yeah, I have no other? argument against the yeah. agent's description right. in file number 2-6. As, as it relates to as it relates to the victim in 2-6, you're correct. Correct. Ms. Bennett, your, your response to the to the narrative that's contained in file ending in 8-4? I'll defer to the, the court on that, Your Honor. I, I, I don't really have a position on that. Well, yeah, this is always problematic. Um, we have a, a series of uh, events that have led to a prosecution, the pros prosecution the attorney general in this particular case, and Bear with me, I want to be sure I look at the information to accurately reflect that. <clears throat> Prosecution chooses to charge um, five separate crimes, uh, four of which were criminal sexual conduct in the first degree, uh, one was criminal sexual conduct in the second degree. Uh, that information was supported by preliminary examination that led to a bind over and it describes a series of, of criminal acts that have been committed by the defendant with respect to this particular victim. It also 
describes the circumstances under which it occurred and i i understand the problem that someone in ms simmons position has in terms of trying to describe that because we simply take a plea and we have the defendant describe one particular act that would constitute the crime for which he's convicted and then we simply move on i think that all of those facts in fact are relevant to the circumstances of the case i believe they adequately describe the circumstances that exist with respect to the defendant and this victim and therefore are properly part of the pre-sentence investigation report i do think it would be helpful for the department to identify in such a narrative the description of the conviction offense that's not to say that other charges that have been dismissed because they were not prosecuted and that there will be no prosecution for other criminal acts that were not part of original charge are not relevant they are relevant to the court's consideration and sentencing and should be part of the description however i think it would be helpful ms simmon if we were to identify a separate section that says this particular conduct describes the conviction offense that would likely help us and help the courts to be able to identify issues with respect to the sentencing guidelines like we had like we struggled with today with respect to offense variables 11 and 12 so i've gotten off on a tangent however but i believe that the description adequately belongs in the report i believe it's a little confusing because we don't know what the conviction offense is but i'm going to deny the motion to amend that you have other corrections mr cherry on page one of cfj 101 yes towards the bottom updating the offense date to reflect july 30th of 2019 okay and then also updating the guideline range to be 51 to 85 and the offense variable total to be 55 all right can you make those appropriate changes miss simmon i i'm having a hard time locating all of them here yeah yes your honor yes i'm aware of where mr cherry is referring to i would make those amendments yeah change change the offense date and change the guideline scoring that we have changed in the other portion of the report any other corrections no your honor miss bennett's did you have corrections or additions to make to the sentence information reports the pre-sentence investigation report or the update of the jail credit i have no additions corrections or deletions thank you your honor all right thank you very much all right um i think it's appropriate before i have allocution from counsel and from the defendant that i take any victim statements i would note for the record that i have received a number of letters that are statements from victims or family members and also a statement from i believe it to be the positive it is the defendant's mother that i reviewed in preparation for this hearing today but i welcome any other victim statements that you wish to offer miss bennett's did you wish to do so yes your honor and i will be reading a couple statements but i'd like to start with miss helsel and there's another ex uh victim who's also on here who wishes to give a statement um there are there is one statement that i would be reading um where the victim did not want to be identified so i'll allow mr cherry to object if you would like to i did send copies to the court and to mr cherry um additionally i did um want to ask the court i know miss helsel's mother and father wrote statements i believe they'd like to make a brief statement if the court allows i did tell the court that i or them rather that it would be up to you it'd be up to your honor whether or not they get to speak today but they did submit letters to you and i know the court has probably read those i have read all the letters mr cherry let's let's deal with it one at a time perhaps so we know where we're headed as to a anonymous victim do you wish to make any objection um if if miss bennett's would represent that they're one of the victims contained within the other act statement i would believe her so as long as that's the case i have no objection you'll assure us of that miss bennett's yes your honor all right very well uh as to the parents making a statement mr cherry your honor i would object to the parents making a statement um they have written letters and i understand the court taking that into account and while they are third person victims of these allegations i don't believe that they're uh they fall under the agreement or the the issues that the court has to consider for sentencing i did not object to their letters being read and the court has already read them um and and i think that that should satisfy any any courtesy that we extend to them all right and your honor go ahead well and miss helsel is a minor and they would be entitled to make a statement on her behalf and i know this is different because um she is going to make her own statement 
but the court does have the discretion to allow them um, to speak even briefly. And, and I will say that I, I, I appreciate Mr. Chair, you're not objecting to them writing a letter. Anybody can write a letter to your court, and I certainly didn't object to Mr. Halpley's mom writing her letter. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the Victims' Rights Act does permit the uh, parents and guardians to make statements. I recognize that there's the dispute with respect to whether or not the victim can speak for himself or whether or not the parents can speak, but this court would, would want to broadly interpret the Victims' Rights Act and allow the parents to speak as long as it's a appropriate uh, victim statement. Uh, I will allow that. Thank uh, you, I'll defer to you. I'll defer to you, Ms. Bennett, on how you proceed, whether you wish to read statements first or whether you wish to have individuals make statements. I'll defer to you. Ms. Helsel, can you hear me, Ms. Helsel? <laughs> Okay, I, I would like Ms. Helsel to be able to make her statement All right. first. Ms. Helsel, would you would you state your name for me, please? Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you give me your name, please? Samantha Helsel. All right, what would you like me to consider, Ms. Helsel? This is your time to make a statement to me before sentencing. Uh, I wrote a little letter. It's The first part is out of something I wrote back in yep. the beginning of this year. Yeah. You, you can read it if you choose to, yes. Okay. January 15th, 2020. My name is Samantha Halsell. I can't even begin to describe how my life has changed by the actions of one person. I feel like I'm trapped in a defiled body. I can't even stand to look at myself, let alone face my family. Simple interactions with other people are impossible. What should feel like a warm embrace for my family feels like I'm being suffocated. I had just started my freshman year of high school. Like every teenage girl, I was beyond excited to see what this new chapter of my life held. I had everything I could have wanted. I was a hitter on my volleyball team. I had straight A's, not to mention I got along with everyone. Nothing in all of my studies, sports, or popularity could have prepared me for the next year of my life. Nothing. My cousin, the defendant, began staying with us for a little while. He was 10 years older than me. If only I knew what kind of monster he was. I was 14 when his filth-ridden hands violated my body for the first time. It seems like it was yesterday. I remember walking around my home, my childhood home, ridden with fear. I remember. I was 15 when the defendant stole my innocence and changed my life forever. 15 years old. It was the summer between freshman and sophomore year. I had taken my nightly prescribed meds for sleep since I have long since stopped being able to fall and stay asleep when I was woken up in the middle of the night. I was dazed, could hardly move. He carried me downstairs. I was disoriented. I didn't understand what was happening until it did. I still feel his cold hand on my mouth in an attempt to silence me. I lay trembling with fear in a pool of blood that night. I had never felt so belittled. The next day, I remember him saying to me, it didn't count because I didn't get it in L.A. We'll try again. I was, four, or I was thir 15 when he took something from me I can never get back. I remember and will never forget. Now I'm 16. Memories come to me unbidden. I never knew how hard it could be to breathe, but I breathed to see that man, my cousin, brought in prison. If it is okay with the court, I'd like to speak directly to the defendant when I say this last part. Well, you may do so, but keep it brief, all right? Thank you. October 5th, 2020, yesterday. I trusted you, but that's what you wanted, wasn't it? You wanted me to confide in you. You wanted to earn my trust, so I could never doubt your judgment and actions. You wanted me to trust you, so when you tried to define my body, I would stay silent. Well, I did for over a year. Over a year, you did whatever your sick and twisted mind wanted to do to me. I stayed silent and listened to everything you told me because I trusted you and believed you loved me. I trusted a monster. I can't remember the last time I said your name. You have no place in my life, and you never will. I want you to know that I haven't been this happy since before I can remember. I have everything I could ever want. I got my license, bought my first car, and even started taking college classes as a sophomore. But most importantly, I let go of my past. I let go of you. I have the most amazing and supportive parents and brothers that 
I will always be able to trust. I realize now that when I say your name or think of all the horrible things you did to me, I don't feel pity for myself anymore. Instead, I feel free from you. I decide what my future holds and who I let dictate it. And you, Nathan Christopher Housel, mean nothing to me. I hope you seek solace in the fact that you have no meaning to me or my life and you threw yours away so you could take advantage of minors. I know I've found solace in the fact that I can do anything I want with my future, and when you think of yours, you're behind bars. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Bennett, do you have other statements? I do. Ms. Housel, at this time, do your parents wish to speak briefly to the court? Or did they want me to read theirs? I know they wrote statements and were thinking of... My mom can read hers if... That's up to them. Do they want to, do they want to read the statements? Yep. She's got to go run upstairs and grab it really quick. Sorry. Well, then I'll, I'll, if that's okay, Your Honor, I'll keep moving and we can come back to that. Yes, we can do that. Your Honor, for clarification, is she planning on reading the written statement that was submitted to the court already for consideration? I, I, I really don't know, but I'm going to allow them to make the statement if they okay. choose to. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and as, if, it, if it's okay with the court, um, as to the other acts, uh, victims who are going to speak. One of them is here. I would like to identify her by initials unless she's comfortable giving her name. Is that okay with the court and with Mr. Cherry? Mr. Cherry, any objection to that? No objection. No objection. Thank you. Yes, who is here with us? Um, if she would like to give her statement now before Ms. Housel speaks. What, what were the initials again? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, we're having a hard time hearing you. I'm sorry. E.S. E.S.? And yes. just so Ms. Bennett is aware, um, E.S. has her name actually spelled I, out in her Zoom, so. I am aware, yeah. but I just wanted for okay. the record to protect their privacy. Yeah. Under, understood. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Ms. E.S., did you wish to make a statement? Yes. <clears throat> I have something written out. Um, how did Nathan Housel affect my life? It's a question that I've been asking myself over and over. The obvious comes up, he sexually assaulted me and that causes quite an effect. So I wanna talk about the aftermath of that, which involves a little backtracking. Before being sexually assaulted, I was normal, literally so normal, it was boring. I got my first kiss when I was 12 and it was such a big deal. It didn't even occur to me at the age anyone would ever want anything more. So when months later, an older boy asked to kiss me, I didn't expect it to turn into the worst day of my life. I had never felt more trapped, victimized, and manipulated than I did that day. People talk about how bad it is during, but after it is the stuff that you have to live with day in and day out. How you mentally start to cope with the fact that you were forced into a situation you had no control in. It's just like any other trauma to the body and your body reacts accordingly. You live with exhaustion, confusion, sadness, anxiety, agitation, numbness, and disassociation all at the age of 12. Those are some really big emotions for someone that age, and I didn't cope well with them. I spiraled. I quickly became overly promiscuous because he had already taken something from me. So maybe if I had, I had more control over it if I made the calls. But when you think that way, you really don't have any control in the first place. He did, still. You make hasty decisions because you are hurting, and you're hurting so badly you just want it to stop. You want to make the whole world stop just so you can breathe because after you can't, you can't breathe because you're riddled with anxiety and rage. And then it starts to get numb because it feels like your body literally can't handle anymore. It just shuts down. You start putting yourself in worse and worse situations because you, you lose any and all respect you had for yourself. So you don't care to keep you safe. Meanwhile, watching him be happy. We lived in the same town and we knew the same people. So I got to watch it all. He had friends, he'd go to parties, he'd lived a normal life, unaffected by what he had done to me. I saw no damage, I saw no remorse, and I had to, I also had to watch him smirk at me every chance that he got, like he was proud of what he had did and he had gotten away with it, and that was his way of reminding me. Because he did get away with it, at least he did for me, but he finally got caught, and finally people can see the sick person that he is, so maybe finally I can heal, and I can breathe, and I can let go knowing that he won't, I won't have to see that smirk ever again. I, always, I also want to say how proud I am of the girls who came forward and say thank you for being braver than I was. Thank you. Ms. Bennett? Uh, Mrs. Housel, would you like to give your statement now to the court? Yes, I have mine and my husband's. His is would, very brief. Would you state your name, please? 
Jennifer Helsel. I'm Samantha's mother. Yes. What would you like me to consider? I come to this court as the mother of only one of the many victims of Nathan Helsel. My husband, my children, and I trusted you. We allowed and welcomed you into our home, never imagining the sick, disgusting person you really were. You told us over and over how you never knew what a family was supposed to be like, cooking together, playing games together, watching movies together as a family. You told us over and over how you never knew what a family was supposed to be like. You have told us over and over how you never do anything to hurt or upset us because you were so grateful. We felt bad you hadn't had a very good childhood and you just needed a little help to get it together and get on your feet. We would never have let you in if we had known you were a sick and twisted monster. We didn't know any better, unlike your family who apparently knew exactly what you were capable of. They also knew we had a teenage daughter under our roof. They still didn't say anything. All the times we trusted you with our children, not knowing you were and had been a pedophile and a child molester. We had no idea showing you kindness and how families were supposed to work would come back to haunt us. I wonder, did you ever mean it when you said you never knew what it was supposed to be like as a family? Did you mean it when you said you were grateful for us taking you in and treating you as our family? Did you mean it when you said Samantha was like a little sister to you? The one thing I'm most thankful for is that you never had a sister. If you think that behavior is okay with a cousin, God only knows what you would have done to your sister. My family has been consumed by you and your disgusting actions for more than a year. I sit and wonder how things would have been different if one of the little girls before had spoken up. I wonder how things would have been different if one of your family members had spoken up instead of defending you, trying to make it go away or paying off people's families. I wonder how many other little girls and how many more years you would have gotten away with being a perverted pedophile. You took my daughter and God knows how many other girls' innocence in what should have been their happy teenage years. You took experiences that should have been theirs to share with a husband and you perverted them for yourself. Every one of these girls will have to live and deal with that fallout, fallout for the rest of their lives. Finally, on behalf of my family, my daughter, all of the girls, and all of the girls' families, I hope that what they say happens to child molesters and pedophiles in prison is true. I hope the justice you have coming continues after you leave this courtroom, and that someday you will truly be sorry for the pain and anguish you have caused to every one of these girls and their families. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. <coughs> Ms. Bennett, you have further statements? Okay, uh, I do, Your Honor. Um, I think Mrs. Helsel wanted to read her husband's statement. I believe it's only a paragraph. Yes. I'm sorry, Ms. Yes. Helsel, did you wish to do that? Thank you. My husband is not comfortable with public speaking, so I'm going to make this quick. His reads, I am a father of five. Anyone who knows me knows I love my children, and I will always protect them as long as I am alive. As an angry father, I wanted this monster to serve the rest of his life in prison, or worse, for what he did to my baby girl. After he took the plea and his bond was revoked, it felt like a weight was lifted from my chest, knowing young girls were safer in our small town. This monster has assaulted many young girls and has gotten away with it. I've had some time to think with a clear mind and know that the plea bargain offered five to 15 years in prison. During the plea hearing, one thing stood out to me. When your honor asked him how old Samantha was, he said he didn't know. He knew, she's his cousin. So out of embarrassment, he said he didn't. So I'm asking the court to sentence this monster to 14 years without parole, so he may never forget how old my baby girl when, was when he molested her. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your Honor, before, before I read a couple of statements that I have, I would just like to note um, and just briefly put into the record uh, Grace Harwell's statement to uh, Ms. Simon. Um, she did not want to be here, uh, but I, I would be remiss if I did not at least read her words very briefly yes. into the record. And this is uh, bottom of page nine. 
listen to page, the top of page 10, um, when Ms. Harwell was interviewed, um, she reported she did not want to speak at sentencing. She just wanted to put this behind her. She states she's not requesting restitution of any kind, nor did she seek medical treatment after the incident occurred, but she's very happy the defendant is finally being held accountable for his actions and that there are severe consequences. Ms. Harwell states that she was traumatized the night of the offense, but she knew if the defendant got what he wanted, he would not cause her any physical harm. She states she's not counseling at this time and just hopes that her story can help others move forward as well. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, just a couple statements um, that I would like to read, and I, these are all statements that both Mr. Terry and the court have gotten. Um, one of the letters is, was written by the mother of two of the other acts victims. They are in the motion. They are listed CM and KM. They are sisters. They are both minors, and their mom wrote a statement on their behalf. Her initials are NP. She writes, Dear Judge Fagerman, I write this letter on behalf of both my daughters who were approached by Nathan Helsel in a very inappropriate manner a few years ago. As a parent and victim myself of sexual abuse and or misconduct, I want to vocalize and stress the importance of the permanent damage and impact this causes, not only temporarily, but for the duration of a person's life. A minor child should not have to ever be forced into an uncomfortable situation that involves sexual advances in any way, shape, and form from any other individual at any time. Any amount of time that is set forth as a punishment for a sex crime being committed does not ever make the crime itself forgivable. I say this for the victim's lives with various mental, physical, and emotional trauma that impacts each and every day of their life for the remainder of their life. When it comes to a crime or crime such as this, to this magnitude, there is no reason why there should be leniency given to the perpetrator for punishment on time to be served. There are many other people who have done far less intrusive or invasive crimes towards other people and have to serve more time than what Nathan is looking at facing because of a plea bargain. I ask that you wholeheartedly listen to each and every person who has come forward with what has happened to them and think of the possibility of the people who have remained silent in fear of what may happen. If they were to come out with what happened to them. There is a history here and it speaks great volumes. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Your Honor, one of the letters I would like to read um, also is the one I'm not going to be identifying by initials. Um, as an officer of the court, this is uh, not only one of the and other I, I, I'm sorry, Ms. Bennett, you, when you're moving away from your microphone, we are not getting your, your transmission. Uh, the next statement I'd like to read is the one I did not want to identify. All right. As an officer of the court, it is not only an other acts victim, um, but for, for Mr. Terry to, to know it was additionally a warrant that I closed out as part of our plea deal on this case. All right. You okay. may do so. And there are some expletives that I'm not going to read in this letter, Your Honor, um, but otherwise I will read it verbatim. All right. I don't know what to say in this letter exactly. I was just told to write down how I feel about this situation. And to be very honest with you, I'm not really sure anymore. I've spent many years keeping these feelings inside of me, and you could say I've learned to live with them. I've learned how to live with the fear that Nate Helsel has brought to my life. The constant looking over my shoulder, no matter where I am or who I am with. I've learned to live with the anger that he has given me, the anger behind everyone thinking that I am a liar because everyone was too effing stupid to think their friend could have ever raped someone. If you really want to know what kind of Nate per person Nate Helsel is, you should try being a 16 year old girl that's boyfriend is friends with me. It's like being the only stake in a den of lions, to me. but he's nice at first. So nice. So caring. He gains your trust. And then you feel like it's okay to be around him. It's not. Nate Huzzle has made my life a living hell. And I haven't seen him probably in four years. Well, if you haven't seen him, then how is he still ruining your life, you might ask? Well, I'll tell you. For the longest time after I was sexually assaulted by Nate, I could not stand the idea of hanging around other men. I thought every single one of them 
were as cruel as me. To this day, I still not can, cannot stand for people to touch me. I can't stand being held for too long or I freak out. I cannot watch shows that even mention the word rape because every single time I hear it, he is the first thing to come to my mind. If you have any idea how many shows or movies have that word in it, not to mention that people like to make jokes about rape. Now, realistically speaking, there probably isn't anything in this letter that this letter could do for anyone, excuse me. But I don't want to be afraid of anything that has to do with need helping. I want to try to live my life as I have been for the past year, learning to live with Nate. People like Nate are not affected by the things, the terrible things they do as a person. They get their, excuse me, dick wet and they leave. But my life took a turn for the worse. And I could sit here and keep telling you all the ways he effed me up. But the truth is, the main thing he took from me that night was the respect I had for myself. It's like I was a stranger in my own skin. With the thought of Nate Housel constantly haunting my brain. Learning to live with Nate. The last statement, Your Honor, I will be reading um, comes from other acts victim, Hey. Hey, All right. dear Judge Fatterman, I write you today as a female that has grown up in this community that is scared that the court will not take Nate Housel's case seriously. I've gone to school with him. He's lived in my home. My mother has called him son. I've known Nate for over 10 years, so I believe I have more than enough right to speak on his character. Nate Housel is a rapist. And a predator, and I 100% know he will do this again if you release him. Nate is one of the first examples that I can think of of a man manipulating me into getting what he wants and to tricking me into letting my guard down, to let him do what he wants to the people around me. I can bet on anything he still doesn't think anything's wrong because to him, getting a female pissed drunk and then waiting to have sex with them is okay. Convincing a female to have sex with him when they change their mind, he doesn't give them a chance to leave, is okay with him. Cornering a female somewhere and using his weight to lay on her until she agrees is okay to him. He is a danger to this community. One of the earliest red flags I can think of is when I asked Nate a question about his previous case when he was 16-ish. I still can hear his voice in my head. Quote, yeah, I had to sell everything, my boat, my truck, everything. But hey, I got out of it. I still remember the smile he gave after, like he was proud that he wasn't truly caught. I'm not sure who the judge was that handled that case because of a height of program, but I can tell you I think that judge let a predator slip through the cracks. If they had actually done something back then and not letting him pay his way out of it, then maybe they wouldn't be, there wouldn't be numerous victims today. I want to assure you that the people who are able to file charges are going to charge are not the only victims. There are other females in this community who are terrified to speak up because of what courts have proven time and time again. That sometimes no matter what, some people won't believe you and having a popular last name will get you out of things. Personally, the last few months have been hell for me. I learned so many people around me experienced the same manipulation and deception from this person that I have. I've been on a roller coaster blindfolded and the amount of thoughts of guilt that I didn't do more or see it sooner have been enough to make me find mental health, no, mental help, excuse me, and going to a doctor to help me. Some nights I don't sleep because I feel like I have to replay memories to make sure I didn't miss anything. I have felt alone this entire experience because truthfully, I really don't like talking about this. It disgusts me to know what he's done and I let him live under the same roof as me. I want to repeat this because I feel like this needs to be said. Waiting until, until a female is drunk and out of her mind, then taking her way to have sex with her is rape. Convincing a female to have sex, and then when she changes her mind and you don't let her, is rape. When you lay your whole 200 pound plus body weight on someone, and when they tell you no, you say, let's just do it, let's just do it, is rape. It's taken a lot for me to write this to you, sir, 
I've done a lot of praying and thinking on this before I did it. I hope you take my words into consideration when a predator like Nate Huzzle is standing in front of you. And I hope you set an example to all other boys in this community who think this is okay. Don't let a rapist slip through the cracks. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are those all the statements you wish to have presented? That is all the statements that I will be presenting to the court at this time. All right, thank you. Mr. Cherry, do you have allocution for the court? Your Honor, the defense would simply ask that you follow the recommendation and agreement. All right, thank you. Ms. Bennett, do you have allocution? Just, just extremely briefly, Your Honor, because I can't say it any better than any of these um, young ladies have stated it, either through letter or by themselves through their words today. Um, I am, I don't want to take anything away from the fact that Mr. Helsel owned up for what he did and that he pled guilty. Um, that being said, I also don't want to give, I don't want to give too much credence or attention to the letter that his mom wrote. There's only one thing that I really want to cite. And that was a line from KK's letter that, and it was really a, an undercurrent theme, dare to tell. I was called a liar, on and on, because of his popular name. And the only reason I cite to that, Your Honor, is because reading Nate Helsel's mom's letter should give the court all it needs in terms of the credibility of those, those young ladies and what they said. Because in that letter, he wanted the court to know who her family was, bold type underline what business they were, how much money they spent on attorneys, as if that was somehow relevant to what happened. And this constant reoccurring theme of he was set up. He took ownership and said he did this. And yet I sit here and still read things from his own family that really gives me um, a real big spotlight into maybe how we got here. This idea that they've known this has been going on and they've let this continue. Um, I just want to commend both Ms. Harwell and Ms. Helsel, who really Ms. Helsel, who set this ball in motion by telling. She told. And when she told, the floodgates opened. And young ladies who were children, who are not children anymore, found their voice. They were very, most, I'm talking about about 17 different young women we've talked to who all wanted to speak today. But at the end of the day, most of them were still terrified to do so. That should tell the court everything it needs to know on why it took so long to get here. But Ms. Helsel opened that door for all these young women. Her bravery at 16 years old is astounding. I don't know the Helsel family. Um, obviously, the court knows I'm not from, from that area. But in my short dealing with this case, I see why these young ladies get in a corner for so long. And I'm so proud of that. I would ask the court to follow the sentence agreement on each of the cases. Um, that Mr. Helsel serve a minimum of 5 to 15 years in the Michigan Department of Corrections. That he be registered as a sex offender uh, pursuant to the statute. Um, any, any other terms and conditions, sex offender counseling while he is in custody. Um, and I just want to thank the court for its patience and its time today. Thank you. Mr. Helsel, uh, if you choose to, do you have anything you want to say before I impose the sentence? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right. Well, it's all been said pretty well here about how serious these events are. Uh, the court is mindful of the problems with enforcement and reporting of sexual assault. Um, this is not an uncommon circumstance. Mr. Helsel has in fact pled guilty. He has reached a sentence agreement with the Attorney General with respect to resolving these two cases and resolving any pending other cases. The sentence agreement is within the guidelines that are prescribed by the, <coughs> the legislature. The court believes that, of course, a sentence above that sentence agreement would also be appropriate for the defendant, but I'm also mindful of the difficulties that the prosecution has with respect to presenting this type of evidence in court. And oftentimes a resolution that involves a sentence agreement is a necessary part of the resolution. 
although the attorney general has spent a great deal of time to display to the court the seriousness of the offenders conduct here and they still urge the court to follow the sentence agreement and i believe the interests of justice are served by so doing in file number two zero one two seven eight four fc the defendant will be committed to the michigan department of corrections for a prison sentence of not less than sixty months and not greater than one hundred and eighty months in the statutory maximum he's entitled to sixty nine days credit against that sentence the mandatory financial assessments are state minimum cost of sixty eight dollars a crime victims rights fee of one thirty those assessments are to be paid as a condition of parole and collection may begin while the defendant's incarcerated the defendant of course will be required to register as a sex offender on the lifetime register mister miss bennett's is there anything else that the people believe the court should address by way of ace in the sentence with respect to file one two seven eight four nothing your honor thank you mister cherry anything else for that file no your honor all right turning then to file number uh... two zero oh one two eight two six the defendant will be committed to the michigan department of corrections for a prison sentence of not less than sixty months and not greater than one hundred and eighty months statutory maximum he's entitled to sixty eight days credit against that sentence financial assessments will be sixty eight dollars of state minimum cost one hundred and thirty dollar crime victims rights fee those assessments are to be paid as a condition of parole and collection may begin while the defendant's incarcerated the defendant of course will be required to register in lifetime under the sex offender registration act uh... miss bennett's anything else you believe i should address in the sentence with respect to the file ending in one two eight two six nothing thank you your honor mister cherry as to that file uh... for the record your honor that sentence would run concurrent with one two seven eight four correct so the record is clear these sentences are in fact current by by law mister kelso i have a right to advise you that you have a right to file an application for leave to appeal your sentence and conviction in these matters to the court of appeals if you choose to do that and if you want me to appoint an attorney for you at public expense to represent you on those appeals you have to fill out the financial information on the forms that i will have sent to you at the jail and you have to return those to the court within forty two days of today's date if you make a decision that you don't want to appeal your sentence and conviction in these matters uh... you can simply dispose of the form do you have any questions for me mister helsel about your rights to appeal no your honor thank you uh... mister cherry did you have anything else for the record no your honor thank you uh... miss bennett's anything else for the record nothing from the people thank you all right that'll be all for the record thank you all very much